Hello and welcome to the podcast, 10 Lessons It Took Me 50 Years to Learn, where we talk to sages, gurus, leaders, and luminaries from all over the world to dispense wisdom for life and career in order to provide you shortcuts to excellence. My name is Duff Watkins, and I'm your host. Our guest today is Barry Nailbuff, who is a professor at the Yale School of Management. Barry has a 30-year career where he's been teaching negotiation, game theory, innovation, strategy. He's authored six books and an online course that I want to talk to you about, Barry. First of all, welcome to the show, Barry. Thank you. This online course is on negotiation, and I want to mention it to the, to the listeners. It's offered through Coursera, which is the site or an organization organized by 200 universities and big businesses. They offer free online education. Your course on negotiation is really, really popular. There are over a, with Coursera, there's over a quarter million active learners at any time. But you are the second ranked, second highest ranked presenter, teacher in the group. And your score is 4.95 out of five. So my first question is, Barry, one year old guy. Who's that person who didn't give me the five? That's what I want to know. Who's that person? Where's the, where's the point oh five? I mean, come on, where, where did you let yourself down? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm a slacker. My God, uh, dude, who's the top guy person? I mean, <laughs> tough audience. Well, I, I, I don't know, but five oh has to be the best. And so four nine five, that's the units they go with. Is uh you know, it hurts, what is it? We're never too Avis. We, we try harder. So uh, there's always room for improvement uh, on that. That's a tough news, man. <laughs> uh, for a course in negotiation, I don't seem to have negotiated very well since I'm giving the course away, but there you have it. <laughs> uh, not all courses on Coursera are free. Uh -huh. uh, and in fact, they're actually slightly annoyed at me because uh, I'm showing up some of the other courses they charge a lot more money for. Uh, but uh, there you go. There you go. That's the... Friend of the people. Now, the other thing I want to point out to listeners, Barry is not some sort of armchair academic. He has founded, participated in two or three, I lose track, Barry, how many companies, two of which have been sold to major multinationals for some serious coin. So that's why when Barry speaks, we listen. And, and it's not an accident that, well, you mean you teach in the school of management, so you know a bit about business. The point is, not only do you teach it, you do it and you do it well. Now. Speaking of money, that takes us into the very, very first lesson. It's actually more of a thought experiment. So you're asking us to do this, Barry. Imagine that we have 10 times more money than at present. The question is, what would you do differently? I think this is the Harry Potter, the reverse mirror desire, where is the mirror of Erisad. The question is, how would you run your life differently if you had no constraints? And after we sold Honest Tea to Coca-Cola, I was in the fortunate position of being in that case where really the financial constraints in my life were lifted. Afterwards, I'm living in the same house, I'm working the same job and married to the same woman. And what that says to me is that in some sense, I was doing things right beforehand because I, it wasn't as if there was something I fundamentally wanted to change in my life as a result of having more financial freedom. and. I'd say, I think an important lesson uh, for people is to say, well, if you're doing what it is you really enjoy doing so that you don't have to change anything, that's a sign that you've got things right. Now there's a flip to that same point, which is there were some things I did differently. For example, I hired a personal trainer and lost close to 40 pounds. Congratulations. Thank you. But I should have done that beforehand. It wasn't that expensive. And so there were some things in some sense, I didn't do some things that I'm glad I didn't do, but the things that I did do differently, I should have done. Mm -hmm. And so another, you can ask is what are the things that you would do if you had a whole lot more coin and you may realize that some of them, there's no reason not to do right away. Yeah. There's nothing stopping yeah. you. There's nothing stopping you. They weren't that expensive mm -hmm. at the end of the day. And so, uh, go for it. Uh, mm -hmm. is my view. You mentioned that company, Honest Tea. And I think when we first met, I don't know if it had actually occurred yet. But I, I do read somewhere, they just sold their two billionth bottle. I don't even know how many zeros are in a billion, but the point is that's a lot of tea. And I remember you said your business success was going to be the recipe and you're going to take tea leaves and douse them with scalding water. And I said, wait a minute, didn't I do that just this morning in my kitchen for breakfast? And it worked for you. Tea that tastes like tea. It was, uh, it's a pretty simple idea. 
But for some reason, everybody else who was selling tea in a bottle was putting in so much sugar that it turned into liquid candy rather than iced tea. So we brought back the basic idea of tea leaves and boiling water. And it worked. Still working. Still working. Yep. Sales are closing in on a half a billion a year now. So people outside my immediate family are apparently buying the product. <laughs> and, and drinking heavily too. Yes. <laughs> All right. Lesson number two, important projects are often easier than trivial ones. Yeah. If you want to get something done, it helps to get a lot of people behind you, chipping in, contributing. And the fact is, if it does really matter, then other folks, everybody's busy. Uh, similarly, if you want uh, your employees, uh, your team members to really care, you want them on Friday afternoon to be saying, damn, I have to wait the whole weekend before I can get back to work on Monday. And that's not going to happen if this is a minor, small thing. And so to the extent that everything you do requires effort, one, you might as well make sure that in the end is worth something. And two, the sense in which in academia, you write a paper, that's a marginal paper. People come up with all sorts of reasons to make you make revisions. They take forever to review it because they don't really care about it, but if it's something that's super exciting. Then they want to see it in print and they want to help you as opposed to frustrate you. And so we tend to think, oh, I can do this project because it's not going to take a lot of work. And the answer is everything takes work. And in some ways, the less work you think it is, the harder it's going to be to finish. And so you might as well go for the, uh, you don't have to do world peace. I mean, let's, let's be clear about that. Yes. So I don't want to say, well, you'd be so ambitious that it'll never happen. But I want you to be a lot more ambitious because the projects that matter in the end of the day actually are ones that are easier to, to make happen. And the bigger, more ambitious projects, they attract more support, more supporters, maybe even more money. And just by thinking big, and as you say, both of them take pretty much the same amount of time or very similar amounts of time. What you thought, you think the big project is going to be a lot harder and longer and the small project, you just kind of it can happen, but they're all, they're bureaucratic obstacles. There's attention obstacles. And so all sorts of obstacles get in your way of these little things. And it's just at some point you get ground down. It's just not exciting. And so it isn't worth it. And I, I said in my own academic uh, world, if I try and publish kind of a little simple add on paper. The referees will take months to review it. They'll come up with all sorts of picky comments because in some ways, everyone could do the little things. And so why are you going to do this rather than me? But when it's the big thing, it's like, wow, I'm excited by that. Let me join this team. Let me make sure this happens. Let me tell other people about it. No one's going to be going and sharing the, the excitement about this small little project we're working on. And so focus your energies on things that matter. Okay. Lesson number three, I think this is for entrepreneurs. And this, by the way, Barry, is the only one I really want to contend with. I want to discuss with you. And for entrepreneurs, you have to be, lesson number three, you have to be fundamentally different and better to get noticed. This flies in the face of all my experience. You, okay. Well, let's hear the objection so I can, uh, okay. Well, not so much an objection. What I know, what I've read is that in marketing perception it's, it's about perception, not product. There is no best product that it's the mind matters more than the marketplace. That is in terms of getting into a person's mind, capturing mind share again, regardless of the quality, the suitability of the product and that people are more interested in what's new rather than what's good or better or best. And finally, that the way to get into people's minds, to get them to behave, to get them to buy things is the simple ongoing repetition of something, anything could be true, could be false, just a simple, and this is known by every marketing department and authoritarian leader. If you have gobs and gobs of money, so you can repeat your message again and again, and you can have all sorts of billboards and TV and digital media. Sure. You might be able to make it happen through repetition, but what are you going to do to get people's attention when you don't have any money? Because that's the situation. If you're an entrepreneur, one way to do that is to solve a fundamental problem that people really end up caring about your product because they understand why it's different and better. And it doesn't have to be on the world peace level. I mean, one of my recent discoveries is a company called good culture and 
they have reinvented cottage cheese. Now, I basically, you know, I had cottage cheese as a kid and then I think it was Kraft cottage cheese or somebody. Basically, they took this product and did nothing with it. Meanwhile, if you think about how yogurt has developed over yeah. the years, now we have full fat, low fat, goat's milk yogurt, sheep's milk yogurt, Greek yogurt, Turkish yogurt. You know, you think about the number of yogurts that are out there. Cottage cheese has more protein than yogurt. Actually, I think has a better chewiness to it. Fewer calories. It's a great product that's done nothing. And so I can get excited about great cottage cheese uh, when it comes down to it. Uh, but it's not just like a little bit better. It is really like, wow, this is what cottage cheese should have been. And I think people felt that way about Greek yogurt, by the way, when that happened. And so that's a sense in which if customers can't really tell the difference, yeah, you can try and persuade them through repetition, through banners, through who knows, fancy slogans, but that's not the situation that I think most entrepreneurs are in. So economics says that you want to go and just offer a little bit lower price and everybody's going to come uh, racing to you. I started one company that failed uh, in New York where we were offering title insurance for people. And this is a crazy thing in the United States. When you buy a house because title registries aren't all centralized by the government, people actually want to get insurance to make sure their title is really correct. And they paid $10,000 for this. It's an insane. Huh. And the total number of claims on title insurance is below 1%. So it's just a whole bogus business. And we were offering it 25% less. And essentially we couldn't break through. It was just not enough of a discount mm -hmm. to get people's attention because they were buying a $500,000 house. And so kind of the $2,500 difference just didn't seem enough on the, on the whole transaction. So you want to be in a situation where you get people's attention because they notice either the fundamental difference in price, difference in quality. And yeah, if you're craft, okay, you can uh, tell me again and again, you know, about this dog food or this ketchup or something, but uh, that's not most entrepreneurs. How do they improve upon cottage cheese? I can't imagine how you, of course, I didn't imagine how you could improve upon tea and you told me how to do that. So how can you improve on, how could you improve on yogurt, right? You use better milk various ways of training it. I don't know how you, how, how you make it, but whatever it is, if I gave you these two next to each other, you would know right away what the difference is. I mean, it's almost the difference between sort of American cheese and real cheese. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, <laughs> and you said earlier on, by the way, about this notion of perception. Look, I agree in the end, it's the perception is what matters. And the perception has to be that you're different. One way to get that perception is to have the reality be fundamentally different and better. So you can either and fool people into thinking it's better and different than it is, or you can try and convince them of the truth. And I'd rather spend my effort convincing them of something that's true than trying to persuade them of something that's only in their head. Well, opinions vary about that, but it, it seems to me on your mortgage example that you did have a substantial reduction from the competitor, but for whatever reason, it was not perceived that way as being significant to the buyer. Because as you say, they're buying a house that's half a million bucks. So what's another few bucks here, but it was significant for, for your business model. And in the end, what we should have done is go more to the commercial market, because when you're buying a $50 million property, now the numbers start really adding up. So that was partly our our challenge was that even though the percentage was large, it wasn't the absolute dollars weren't enough really to get people's attention to go with an unproven company, in spite of the fact that we had Lloyd's of London being our backstop. So you needed people to actually pay attention. So one view is they should never care about this because they're never going to make a claim. They're only getting it because the bank is making them getting it. But it's like, why should they pay attention? The lawyer says, who are these people? We've never heard of them. Now go with this tried and true. But if I want somebody to go and do some investigation, you know, for $15,000, they're going to, they're willing to do it, not maybe for 2000. And so the other message is that even the smart guy from Yale had a failed business attempt. So like, like every other entrepreneur, <laughs> well, let me put it this way. I was failed as a, I was a, on the board an investor, but, uh, yes, not all my investments succeed. Right. Right. Which is the nature of business. Lesson number four, I, I know you've done some negotiation work with the NBA, that's the National Basketball Association, the Professional Basketball League in the U.S., just in case there's anybody on the planet left who doesn't know what the NBA is. So you, you've been involved in their negotiations. 
and I think you said this comes from them. Point number four, if you think A is the right solution, but others prefer B, then make an impassioned, robust case for point B before you suggest that point A is the right solution. So this is a, a lesson I learned uh, from David Stern, who uh, recently passed the former commissioner of the NBA. Right? And we know this in law that you want to bring up the other side's arguments before they bring them up. And negotiation is often viewed as a test of wills. It's they make some argument. You have to show them why they're wrong. Well, people then keep on arguing when they don't get their way. They think the reason they're not getting their way is because they're not being understood. And if only they could really be better understood, if you only appreciated their arguments, you would be more likely to accept their position. Now, what's the best way to convince somebody you understand their perspective? Well, if you make their arguments for them, that's a great demonstration that you understand where they're coming from and why they want to be. Now, after you've done that, what happens? Well, one, they don't have anything left to say because you've already made their arguments and there's no point repeating. And secondly, they're not confused about whether or not you understand why they want B. You better, of course, have some arguments for why A is the right choice. That's better than B. But we spend all of our time trying to knock down somebody's arguments against B. The end result is that they're convinced that we don't understand why, why B has some advantages to it. So when you demonstrate that you do understand B, understand it well, that puts you in a position to refer more authoritatively to solution A. And as you say, you got to have some arguments for that to support that. Yeah, I'm okay with the authoritative, but I, I want to emphasize something else, which is if you're the B supporter, I've made all of your arguments for you. You have nothing left to say because there's no point repeating. That's just taking up airtime. That doesn't help. And then the other thing is, are you still concerned that I don't understand your arguments? And I've eased that issue. So if you're not getting your way, it's not because you haven't been understood. And that's a critically important thing that the more you argue against the other person's claims, the more they think you're not understanding them. And it's scary because you're acknowledging there's some validity to their arguments. And therefore we think, oh my God, that means I'm gonna have to give them B. No, there better be just some other more powerful, more valid arguments in favor of A. It's sounding like a great way of diffusing arguments. Uh, something I learned from Herb Cohen many years ago, a world famous negotiator, just draining the emotion from it. I mean, and as you're right, I mean, if you're a point B supporter, it's very hard to say, uh, yeah, what Barry just said, yeah, that's our position. I mean, that makes it superfluous. I'm a huge Herb Cohen fan as well. I've learned many lessons from him. We see this with kids. Uh, if you want to get a kid to leave the swimming pool, and you say, go on, time to go home for dinner. The kids uh, basically starts crying. And why is that? Well, one, they don't want to leave the pool, but two, they don't have the vocabulary to articulate why it is they think the pool is the cool place to stay. And so by helping them verbalize their arguments, you demonstrate that they're leaving the pool, not because the pool isn't fun. It's because it has to be some better reason. Look, we're going to go home. By the time we get home and have dinner ready, you're really going to be hungry. And it's not just you. There are other people who are going to be hungry. And therefore, as much as I'd like to spend the rest of my life in the pool, and God knows I do, <laughs> at some point we do have to eat and, uh, and not just you. And that's that the inability of the other side to either verbalize or have the view that you haven't understood them is what I really am trying to emphasize here. And by the way, when you make their arguments, don't assume you've got it right. So you should always say, have I understood, is that correct? Have I misleft anything out? Is that really what's motivating you here? Good examples all the way. Very good. Lesson number five, good people are led to act poorly because of their poor incentives. I um, was once doing a consulting assignment for a company and there was a salesperson who was effectively a one-man price war. And as a result, prices kept on going down in this industry. And we were trying to figure out how to end the price war. And the answer is we were the ones starting it. And why was it? Well, this gentleman 
uh, was constantly getting his full bonus for hitting his sales targets. And nobody seemed to care about his profit margin. Mm -hmm. He focused on his Q, not his P. And so you could tell the person all day long not to go out there and try and steal everybody else's business. But at the end of the day, we seem to reward him for that. So that's what he did. And one view is, well, we should fire this person. And the answer is no, we should fire ourselves because we were the ones who were rewarding him for doing the wrong thing. And when we changed set of contract and made it clear, the guy's behavior changed. And so he understood how he was being compensated and reacted quickly. And you're glad to think, oh, I'm going to pay you for this, but I'd really like you to do that. And it turns out that doesn't work. That people figure out what it is that you're paying them for. Because the guy is smart. Of course he figured it out. And of course, I've seen that replicated in so many companies. My, my wife was a, a banker at Citibank. And they would give her a bonus based on the fee she would earn on the first year of her contracts when she signed up another bank. And these were tend to be three and five year contracts. Of course, when you bring in the new customer in, what they fundamentally cared about was getting a great deal in year one so they could look good. So we had this whole problem because from her perspective, she only cared about year one fee. From the banks, uh, the customers think they, in some sense, wanted the first year fee to be low. She wanted it to be high. And nobody seemed to care about years two through five. <laughs> and so at one point, we talked to, you know, to the senior managers. It was like, well, why isn't the bonus based on the lifetime value of the contract, not just the first year fee? The answer is, well, what happens if the person leaves? And the answer is, we'll send you a forwarding address to send the checks. So you know, it doesn't. That uh, we appreciate that the money hacks to come in in years two through five, but when it does, you can pay a bonus uh, based on that. And so you've created this incentive scheme whereby. You made it harder for us to make the customer happy and to bring the new customer on board. I mean, you know, people are not dummies. They, they see which behavior is being rewarded. They can figure it out and that's how they act. I mean, it doesn't, you know, I'm not at all, no longer listening to what the bosses say. You know, I, I can, I can see where, uh, who gets rewarded and for what actions. So there are just, if you look around, it's not hard to find cases where incentives are misaligned and when you find them just. Fix the incentives and behavior will follow rather than try and change the behavior directly. Pretty simple, isn't it? Fix the incentives, the behavior will follow. But it's not so simple because people don't see those cases. I I'll give you one that's, I think, very uh, well hidden. In the United States, people are really trying to get a tax on gasoline for carbon. And folks have talked about a 50 cents a gallon tax, a dollar, two dollars. No one even thinks a $3 tax is at all feasible politically. If you look at the way auto insurance is sold, auto insurance is sold on an all you can drive basis. By that, I mean, you pay the same amount for auto insurance. If you drive 10,000 miles or hundred thousand miles a year, which is insanity. It's like saying, I'm going to charge you the same amount for gasoline. If you drive 10,000 or hundred thousand miles a year, no, you pay 10 times as much for gas and the average person who drives. 12,000 miles a year pays roughly $1,200 for gas and $1,200 for insurance. And so insurance is about the same price as gasoline. What that means is if you had to pay for insurance on a per mile basis, which is the smart way of doing it, it would effectively double the price of gasoline. So it'd be like the equivalent of another $3 a gallon tax. So we are subsidizing people to drive more by saying, we're not going to charge you an extra $3 for 25 miles of driving, which is what we should be doing. And as a result, people drive too much. More of a user pay system. The more you drive, the more you pay. Correct. And the answer is obvious. You just have to say, wait a second, how come we're not doing that here? Well, the answer, I suppose it would be the entrenched interests that have um, financial incentives to uh, keep it the way it is. Well, so I, I served on the board of a fortune 100 insurance company for a dozen years, and I was pushing them the entire time to, to do this. One challenge is that men drive twice as much as women and pay the same amount for auto insurance. If you're going to go to a pay per mile basis, you have to raise your rates on half your customers and lower your rates on the other half. 
Well, those people you raise your rates on might leave you and take with them their homeowner insurance, their life insurance, mm -hmm. and other products. And so that's a challenge. But what's happened since then is companies like Metro Mile have come in and are offering pay per mile insurance. And so all the people who are low mileage drivers are moving over to them. And what does that do? That leaves you stuck with a really high mileage people who are being subsidized. And so eventually that system collapses because the people that ultimately have to keep on raising their price and then they're going to leave. But it takes a while. That's why it's hard for the incumbents to change. So it's not as easy and straightforward as it appears. But the, again, the point is align your incentives with the, the behaviors that you want repeated. Okay. Lesson number six. This is for every manager out there. I want you to hear this. In fact, write it down. For each action you take, think of three perspectives. First, what is the effect will have on the current situation? Two, what is the effect will have on the precedent? Three, what is the effect it will have on my relationship with others? So I'll give you an example of where I got this wrong about myself in trouble. I served on a board where we had uh, great trips to Hawaii and Paris and all sorts of things where we would meet the top salespeople. And the management of the company gave us, the board members, the same kind of, I don't know, I won't call them tchotchkes because they were more that rewards, uh, presents that they would give their top salespeople. Things like Apple watches, funky, fancy sunglasses and so mm -hmm. on. And I pointed out, you know, it's one thing for us to be there because we want to congratulate and reward the salespeople, but we hadn't done the sales. We weren't entitled to these presents, these uh, bonuses. Management wasn't giving it to themselves. They were just giving it to the top performers. So why were we getting this? And on the scale of things, you know, I don't know, maybe it was a thousand dollars. So it wasn't like a huge amount of money, but I thought we we're in the process of cost tightening and he was just sending the wrong signal. And some of the management folks, they said, you know, thank you for saying that because some of our staff, you know, they feel a little jealous about this. They don't think it's really right, but they didn't want to upset the board. So it has to come from the board. And so I proposed this and it passed unanimously because how could anybody possibly object to this? You can't really say, yeah, we should be getting these things that we don't deserve. And then it turns out many of my board members' spouses were all upset. Because they like those things because their spouses were just too damn cheap to get it for them. <laughs> and uh, so I really pissed off a lot of my colleagues in this <laughs> process and hurt my relationships. The question was, was it worth doing or not? And uh, it was a small battle. And the end of the day, it didn't really make a lot of difference in terms of the money. And so I don't know. I mean, my view in life is I really care about making the right decision. And I care less about the effect it has on other people in my relationships. Uh, and the precedent, uh, I care about that, but I suspect I would have been more effective in the long run if I cared about those things uh, more as well. Oh, uh, possibly, possibly. I think it says more about the, the board members and their spouses than it does anything else. I mean, let's not overlook that fact, but, but humans are, I, I get it, but I had, I had to work with them, right? They're there. Yeah, yeah, they're, yeah, yeah. They're only anywhere and they're going to be for the next 10 years. And so, okay, some of them were small-minded and cheap. I got it. Now the question is, what do I do about that? Well, take it into consideration and modify your behavior accordingly or not. I mean, that's what it comes down to, I suppose. I mean, they're getting, you know, $300,000 a year for being a board member. So it's not like he was, you know, and they're whining about losing $1,000 in, uh, in little presents. Anyway, so I tried to set the right example, but I said it. It definitely hurt my interpersonal relations. And you, know, you spend a lot of time having dinner with your other board members and often their spouses on these trips. Well, I'm a little surprised by that. And I can understand it being a kerfuffle, if that's the word I'm searching for, but for it to linger and carry on and be extended past, you no know, eight, 12 minutes. Well, that's, uh, I, <laughs> that's what I'm dealing with, my friend. Yeah, well, I'd so, so here's the thing, Jeff. Had you been on the board with me, you would have made the same decision, and I wouldn't have had that problem with you. Yeah, yeah. But, used, for the, yeah. Well, but for the other folks, some of them, well, you know, that was not who they were. And so you have to think about what are you going to, when, when small minded people protect their own interests. You know, this was a case of, remember, I, uh, one of our earlier points is you should focus on the big things around the little things. 
there were big issues that I cared about too. If I'm going to piss somebody off, I might as well piss them off on the big things. Yeah, I dropped the little ones. Yeah, so spend your political capital wisely, I suppose, is my take on that. All right. Well, that takes us to point number seven. It isn't enough to be right. You must persuade others that you are right. Yeah. And, and this is something that's, I'd say, the biggest difference between a professor and being in the real world. Because in academia, the best thing that ever happens is you go out there with your theory, your research, and everyone says, oh, that's completely BS. It'll never work. And then 10 years later, people discover you were right. You win your Nobel Prize, you get your tenure, whatever it is. And it's like, wow, look how smart, original that person must be because no one thought it could ever work. In the real world, if you're proven right 10 years later, that doesn't help because it's sort of, you haven't, you haven't launched, you haven't made it happen. Uh, and so there's a distinction between having the right idea and making it convincing others now, not in 10 years. It doesn't help to say, yeah, you know, that idea about that iced tea thing that people said wouldn't work. Look, 10 years later, somebody else did it. I was right. Uh, no, I don't, it's what I've, you have to go and get people to be believers. The, I told you so gets you a huge amount of points in academia, not in the world. <laughs> Number eight, be prepared for people to screw up. And my corollary to that is, and they will not disappoint you. So. There's a, many a slip betwixt cup and lip and that in general, people say to me all the time, you know, oh, you're micromanaging, you're sort of worried about all things that can go wrong. But the answer is the amount of stupidity that's out there never fails to <laughs> surprise me. So, uh, I, my favorite examples of this, I'll give you two. We went to one store at Honest Tea where they weren't uh, putting honest tea in the cooler right next to the salad bar. And we said to the manager there, look, here's some data showing our tea outsells the product you have there two to one in your store. So can you please put our product in the cooler here? I know that we used to have the tea there. The problem is it sold out so quickly that the shelves were empty by lunchtime and then we got complaints. <laughs> So I put this new thing in there. It doesn't sell. And now it's not a problem. He's like, okay, I want to shoot him at this point. Yeah. I said, well, what about just restocking? He said, well, if I restock, then it's not cold. And I said, well, what about taking cases, putting them in the cooler in your back? So when you restock, you restock with chilled product. He said, well, I'm not allowed to do that because your product's shelf stable. And we have to reserve the refrigerated area only for products that need to be refrigerated. Okay, so let me get right. So basically your solution is to put stuff in that doesn't need to be restocked because that's how you're going to uh, make customers happy by giving them stuff they don't want. No, it's how no one to make his job easier <laughs> with fewer hassles. So in the end, what our solution was is we bought the guy a bigger fridge. <laughs> so, uh, because ultimately his problem was our problem. But nonetheless, it's like, you know, yeah, guess what? If you don't open up the store until five in the afternoon, you don't have to worry about restocking for lunch. And so another case is we had a distributor who told us he wouldn't carry our product because he wasn't making five bucks a case. And I'm thinking that doesn't make any sense. Snapple, you know, what do you make with Snapple? He says, I make 720 with Snapple. And I'm thinking, wait a second, you know, you're making what? 450 with us. How can you make so much more with Snapple since our product sells for more? And then I realized Snapple comes in 24 bottle cases. We come in 12 bottle cases. So in a 24 bottle equivalent, he'd be making $9 with us versus seven twenty with Snapple. Darn that. Or and, I take, and I said, look, you know, you're comparing a 24 bottle case to a 12 bottle case, you know? And I said, look, if we took two of our cases and wrapped them together with tape, would that work for you? So yeah, that worked. I'd make nine bucks a case. So can you just wrap them in your mind, please? <laughs> now, what I love about this is that it's so real, so true, so accurate. And I think anybody in business has had similar experiences. In another company I'm in, we just got kicked out of a large supermarket chain because they didn't think our unit volume was high enough. And yet we were killing it on dollar volume. Why? Because we were $9.99 for five pouches. 
and we're going up against other people who are selling single cups for 279. So our unit volume could be half of theirs and our sales could be three times theirs. And it's like, what do you care about units or do you care about dollars? And it's like, yeah, well, I'm being measured on the unit velocity. And so they, this is going back to that old notion. If you give people the wrong incentives, they do the wrong thing. In my case, we ended up being screwed by it. And because of the pandemic, we didn't have the chance to make our case in person, but it's just insanity. So in the end, by the way, we had to move to start selling single pouches. And so, because that way we had many more units, but we're measured on stuff that makes no sense. The thing that I see here, and I, I, you know, I've been management consulting for decades now is so many companies don't actually understand their own business. And as you say, they're measuring the wrong things, sign up for the wrong things. And the whole idea is to create a customer and keep a customer. You do that and you're pretty much on the right track. And then come up with silly rules. Like I'm going to mark everything up 30% and not make a distinction between a product that's a, a premium product or a generic product. And so if you're selling honest tea at $2 and Snapple at one. Do you actually need to make 60 cents in every bottle of Snapple versus 30 cents on a, I'm sorry, 60 cents on a bottle of honest tea versus 30 cents on a bottle of Snapple? In the end mm. of the day, the customer is going to buy one bottle. And so I don't claim that profits have to be the same on each. So you might say, I want to make 40 cents on honest tea and 30 cents on Snapple, but why don't I watch to be double? And they basically say, well, you know, my analysts are just looking at my profit margin. But ultimately it's profits, not profit margin that matter. And you want the customer to buy the $2 thing. So you could make 40 cents around the $1 one. So you can make 30. And they're actually discouraging customers from buying the products where they make more money. And so uh, instead of thinking about what our profit margin should be on each product, they just say for this whole category, we're going to impose a 30% or 40% or whatever markup rule they're using. And that just penalizes anybody who has a premium product. And so it pushes everybody towards the, the low end, which is not great. Mm. And this is true even at Amazon, where you think that they have, you know, literally thousands of people who are plenty smart and super data focused, uh, to get this right, but they don't. I think what you're also illustrating is the resistance that people have when the explanation is proffered to them. And I really like the lateral thinking you did by buying the guy a, a new refrigerator, a new cooler, because that's a win-win situation. That's thinking laterally, thinking outside. But that's the problem. They don't get to think that what companies do is they create rules so they can be run by idiots because eventually they will be. That was the <laughs> Peter Lynch line. You want to invest in a company that can be run by an idiot because eventually it will be. And, and the problem is the company doesn't want folks thinking. And so. Uh, either they don't think, or they're not allowed to. And that's the, uh, that's the challenge. And it goes back to our earlier line about incentives. Mm -hmm. And this guy being incentivized to move unit volume or another case in the company I was involved with, basically we were making products at below efficient scale because we're new. And so what that meant is we would do a larger production one that made sense. So we therefore have more inventory, but the person who's in charge of inventories basically was killing us saying, oh, you're, you know, all my metrics are looking terrible because in this matrix organization, he didn't care about what our cost of production was. He only cared about what his inventory turns were. So everybody looks at their one piece of the picture and not the, the big piece, not the full. Piece. All right. We'll move on to lesson number nine, which is feel free to bend the rules. For example, if somebody asks you for a, a list of 10 life lessons, you can bet that they'll be pretty happy with nine. Hey, wait a minute. You talking to me? I'm afraid I am. <laughs> so, uh, one of the things that's true in life is that, uh, the rules are things, you know, I'm not talking about antitrust laws or laws of physics. I don't want to get, repeal gravity, <laughs> but in negotiations and most things, the rules are what you agree they are. And so feel free to, uh, talk about them right at the beginning. I say in negotiation, let's talk about how we're going to negotiate. What's our ground rules for negotiation? Don't, don't jump in to talk about price. Don't jump in to talk about reasons. Let's talk about how it is we're going to negotiate. And in general, uh, people, I think are a little quick to accept the rules. And you're pointing out that there was, there is flexibility. There is latitude, whether you see it or not, whether you acknowledge it, it's there. 
It's there. It's just one unexplored. So there you go. Your nine lessons for today. One final question. What have you unlearned lately? Something you absolutely knew to be positively true then, a while ago, could be years ago, could be yesterday, but now you know it's not the case at all. One of my models in life is often wrong, never in doubt. <laughs> yeah. And so I think I've been wrong about so many things that it'd be hard for me to figure out which one uh, it is that I have unlearned. Uh, I'm with you. I mean, I've been wrong about so many things. My new motto in life, and has been for the last few years, few years is don't be so sure. I just want to tell myself all the time. Yes. <laughs> well, I, I want to try and flip that on you. It's fine to be sure, as long as you realize that you're often wrong. Let's just say I have a steady stream of disconfirming evidence coming at me all the bloody time. So, and, and that's all right, too. That's no thing. I quite accept this happen. You know, if I'm wrong, I'm happy. You know, just just let me know as we get on with it. In fact, one of the things I did, you can give a link to this piece in the New York Times, where is really a test to look for disconfirming evidence. That people are always trying to find evidence that supports their hypothesis. And that what a good scientist does, and I think actually a good entrepreneur does, is look for evidence that proves themselves wrong rather than proves themselves right. That's what Don Pepper says. He quotes a story about Warren Buffett. I don't know if it's true, but it's worth repeating. He says, when Warren Buffett wants to make an investment, hires a team of advisors to tell him what he should, and then he hires a team of advisors to tell him why he should not. And then he listens. It's the red to team and the blue team. Mm -hmm. And Israel does that with its in, uh, intelligence. And the Pope does this when you elevate somebody to sainthood. It's the advocatus diabli. And so I think we need a lot more of the devil's advocate out there. And the, the idea that you could be arguing against something, even if you believe in it, because we want to make sure both sides of the arguments have been heard. And we'll close on that note. Folks, you've been listening to the podcast and lessons that took me 15 years to learn where we dispense wisdom for career and life. Our guest today has been Barry Nelba from the Yale School of Management. This episode is produced by Robert Hosry and is sponsored as always by Professional Development Forum, which offers insights, media, discussions, podcast parties, anything you want, everything you need. And it's all free online. You can find it at professionaldevelopmentforum.org. You've heard from us, we'd like to hear from you. Email us. It's podcast at 10lessonslearn.com. That's podcast 10, number one, zero, lessonslearn.com. Why? Go ahead and hit that subscribe button because remember, this is the podcast, the only podcast that makes the world wiser, lesson by lesson. Thanks for listening.